10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, see The ultimate political goal at the heart of our age is the idea of individual freedom. I believe that freedom is the future of all humanity. In Britain, our government has set out to create a revolution that will free individuals from the control of old elites and bureaucracies. A new world where we are free to choose our lives, not be trapped by class or income into predestined roles. To liberate Britain from all the old class divisions, old structures, old prejudices, to liberate the individual. And abroad, in Iraq and Afghanistan, Britain and America have set out to liberate individuals from tyranny. For those leading it, it is just a first step in a global revolution for democracy. But if one steps back and looks at what has resulted, it is a very strange kind of freedom. The attempt to liberate people from the dead hand of bureaucracy has led to the rise of a new and increasingly controlling system of management, driven by targets and numbers. While governments committed to creating freedom of choice in all areas have actually presided over a rise of inequalities and a dramatic collapse in social mobility. The consequence has been a return of the power of class and privilege. And abroad, the attempt to create democracy has led not just to bloody mayhem, but a rejection of the American-led campaign to bring freedom. And it has summoned up an anti-democratic authoritarian Islamism. This in turn has helped inspire terrorist attacks in Britain itself. In response, the government has dismantled long-standing laws designed to protect our freedom. This is a series of films about how this strange paradoxical world came to be created. It begins in the dark and frightening days of the Cold War. And it will show how what we have today is a very narrow and peculiar idea of freedom that was born out of the paranoia of that time. It is based on an image of human beings as selfish, isolated and suspicious creatures who constantly monitor and strategize against each other. The films will show how politicians and scientists came to believe that this idea of human nature could be the basis of a new type of free society. But what none of them would realize was that within this dark and distrustful vision lay the seeds of a new and revolutionary system of social control. It would use the language of freedom, but in reality it would come to entrap us and our leaders in a narrow and empty world. At the end of the Second World War, America and American films celebrated not just victory, but what many believed would be the dawning of a new era. I'm singing a song of freedom. Back then, freedom meant not just liberation from the Nazis, but also from the economic chaos and uncertainty that had caused the depression of the 1930s. Governments now believed that their role was to manage and control the economy and protect society from the dangerous self-interest at the heart of capitalism. Why can't we? No longer did we worship at the shrine of no-holds-barred capitalism. No. We had been through the depression of the 1930s. We had been through World War II. Now we were talking about the need for government to be the major balancing element in the economy. The individual was still important, but government would make sure that we would never slide into a deep depression again. In the following years, the bureaucracies at the heart of the state grew enormously. Their job was to regulate capitalism for the benefit of everyone, 
In an age of optimism, there were few who challenged this new vision. But one man on the margins was convinced it would lead to disaster. He was an Austrian aristocrat called Friedrich von Hayek, who had fled the Nazis and now taught at the University of Chicago. Hayek was convinced that the use of politics to plan society was far more dangerous than any problems produced by capitalism, because it inevitably led to tyranny and the end of freedom. The terrible example that Hayek pointed to was the Soviet Union. In their search for a utopia, the Soviet leaders had tried to plan and control everything, but this had led them into tyranny and dictatorship. The same would now inevitably happen to the West, he said. It was on what he called the road to serfdom. The only way of avoiding disaster was to go back into the past, back to a golden age of the free market, where individuals followed their own self-interest and government played little or no role. Out of this would come what Hayek called a self-directing automatic system, a spontaneous order created by millions of people pursuing their own gain. We will benefit our fellow men most if we are guided solely by the striving for gain. For this purpose, we have to return to an automatic system which brings this about, self-directing automatic system which alone can restore the liberty and prosperity. That is my fundamental conception. Isn't it a philosophy based essentially on selfishness? What about altruism? Where does uh, that come in? It doesn't come in. Hayek's ideas were dismissed by politicians and economists. The notion that one could create social order in a modern, complex world simply by unleashing individual self-interest was seen as a failed and discredited idea. But proof that he might be right was about to emerge from the most unlikely of sources, from scientists struggling with the new, terrifying uncertainties of the Cold War. This is the heart of a giant, blast-proof bunker 30 miles north of New York. Built in the late 50s, it housed the largest computer in the world, linked to a system of radars around the world, which constantly watched the Soviet Union. Every second, thousands of pieces of information poured into this room to be analysed for signs of danger. The nuclear strategists who had designed this system knew they were dealing with a completely new type of conflict. Neither side could let it get out of control because of the terrifying consequences. So the strategists wanted to find a way of using the information to anticipate what the Soviets might be about to do. And to do this, they turned to a new idea called game theory. Game theory had been developed as a way of mathematically analyzing poker games. It looked at the game as a system where the players are locked together each trying to work out what the other thinks they will do. From that, game theory showed rationally what the best moves were for each of the players. This is a type of war that had never been fought before. And of course, as we all know, it would be so devastating that it's almost impossible to consider all of its consequences. They still wanted to say that there was a rational way to approach such a virtual war and game theory seemed to offer that to them, that you could, in a sense, incorporate your enemy into your own thinking, that you could mathematically understand what your enemy would do to the point where you and your enemy will play the exact same uh, set of strategies. The Center for Developing Nuclear Strategy was a military think tank called the RAND Corporation. And the strategists at RAND used game theory to create mathematical models that predicted how the Soviets would behave in response to what they saw the Americans doing. Out of this came the fundamental structure of the nuclear age. Hundreds of missiles protected in silos underground, and fleets of bombers in the air 24 hours a day. Just as in a game, they were strategic moves to convince the Soviets that if they attacked, America would always have enough missiles to destroy them in return. In the rules of this game, fear and self-interest stopped the Russians from attacking, and it created a stable equilibrium called the delicate balance of terror. Recommending 
missiles underground, missiles and submarines and all that was a way of making that much more stable. Sometimes the way I used to explain it is we're trying very hard to reduce the likelihood of nuclear war by creating powerful incentives for the Russians not to it, to start a nuclear war because we're trying to give them incentives not to attack either a nuclear attack or with a conventional attack. Yeah, so incentives are important in that. Underlying game theory was a dark vision of human beings who were driven only by self-interest, constantly distrustful of those around them. And there was a mathematician at the Rand Corporation who would take this dark vision much further. He set out to show that one could create stability through suspicion and self-interest, not just in the Cold War, but in the whole of human society. He was the mathematical genius, John Nash. Nash was portrayed in the Hollywood film, A Beautiful Mind, as a tortured hero. In reality, Nash was difficult and spiky. He was notorious at Rand for inventing a series of cruel games. The most famous he called Fuck You, Buddy, in which the only way to win was to ruthlessly betray your game partner. Nash took game theory and tried to apply it to all forms of human interaction. To do this, he made the fundamental assumption that all human behavior was exactly like that involved in the hostile, competitive world of the nuclear standoff. That human beings constantly watched and monitored each other, and to get what they wanted, they would adjust their strategies to each other. In a series of equations for which he would win the Nobel Prize, Nash showed that a system driven by suspicion and selfishness did not have to lead to chaos. He proved that there could always be a point of equilibrium in which everyone's self-interest was perfectly balanced against each other. The equilibrium, this equilibrium which is used, is that what I do is perfectly adjusted in relation to what you are doing. And what you're doing, or what any other person is doing, is perfectly adjusted to what I'm doing or what all other people are doing. They are seeking separate optimization, just like poker players. Is each player alone? That's the idea, that they are alone, they're separate. Doing something that's very non-cooperative but very selfish. And then what all of them do works together and there's, deriving from that, there is a payoff to all the players. That is the equilibrium. But it's understood not to be a cooperative ideal. But the stability, the equilibrium, would only happen if everyone involved behaved selfishly. Because if they cooperated, the result became unpredictable and dangerous. A famous game was developed at Rand to show that in any interaction, selfishness always led to a safer outcome. It was called the Prisoner's Dilemma. There are many versions, but all of them involve two players having to decide whether to trust or to betray each other. Imagine you have stolen the world's most valuable diamond. You have agreed to sell it to a dangerous gangster. He offers to meet you to exchange the diamond for the money. But you think he may kill you. So instead, you tell him you will take it to a remote field and hide it. While at the same time, he must go to another field hundreds of miles away and hide the money. Then you will call him and each will tell the other the hiding place. But just as you are about to make the call, you realize you could betray him. You keep the diamond, and then you go and get the money, while the gangster searches fruitlessly in an empty field. But at the very same moment, you realize that he is probably thinking the same thing, that he could betray you. You have no way of predicting how the other person will behave. That is the dilemma. But what Nash's equation showed was that the rational choice was always to betray the other person. Because that way, at the worst, you got to keep the diamond. 
and at the best, you got both the diamond and the money. But if you trusted the other person, you ran the risk of losing everything, because he might betray you. It was called the sucker payoff. What the prisoner's dilemma expressed was the strange logic of the Cold War. The optimum solution, offering to get rid of all your weapons, provided the Russians did the same, could never happen. Because you couldn't trust them not to cheat. So instead, you went for stability, created by a balance of dangerous weapons on both sides. And what Nash had done was to turn that into a theory of how the whole of society worked. It had enormous implications for politics, because it proved that one could have a society based on individual freedom that wouldn't degenerate into chaos. But the price of that freedom would mean a world in which everyone would have to be suspicious and distrustful of their fellow human beings. The Nash Equilibrium is important because one of the great fears of politics is that self-interest would lead to utter chaos. And what the Nash Equilibrium suggests is that a rational pursuit of self-interest, even in the face of implacable, hostile enemies, will lead to a kind of an order uh, in which all players agree upon the strategies that they're playing and that those strategies make sense to them. But at the same time, it's also paranoid because it's the idea of a human being sitting alone in a room, being able to totally reconstruct their opponent. Their opponent is totally implacable, totally hostile, and bent on their destruction. But there was a small problem with Nash's equations. They didn't seem to correlate with how human beings actually behave towards each other in the real world. When the Prisoner's Dilemma game was tested out on the secretaries of the RAND Corporation, none of them played the rational strategy. Instead of betraying each other, they always trusted each other and decided to cooperate. And what no one realised was that John Nash himself was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. He had delusions in which he believed that those around him who wore red ties were communist spies and that he was part of a secret organisation that could save the world. You don't want to admit that you are crazy. You see the other people as crazy, but you like to think of yourself as not crazy, as rational. So I thought there were some secret organizations of humans or secret uh, beliefs um, among some categories of humans, and uh, I thought I had some relation to that. I heard voices, and... I ultimately realized that I didn't hear anything but something that I created in my own mind. I was talking to myself mentally. In 1959, Nash was forcibly committed to a mental hospital, and he would spend the next 10 years battling schizophrenia. But despite the obvious problems with Nash's theories, the young technocrats at Rand were convinced that in them lay the seeds of a new form of ordering society based on the free individual. Because the equations provided a scientific basis for the alternative vision that Friedrich von Hayek had called for. But for the moment, these ideas remain confined to a few thinkers at the heart of the nuclear establishment. But Nash's ideas were about to spread in the most surprising way. A thousand miles away, there was a radical psychiatrist who had a vision. He wanted to make people free of all constraints that he believed controlled their minds without them realising. And to make them free, like Nash, he would fundamentally question and undermine the old ideas of trust and love. Is love possible? Is freedom possible? Is the truth possible? Is it possible to be one's actual self with another human being? Is it possible to be a human being anymore? Is it possible to be a person? Do persons even exist? R.D. Lang had 
begun work as a psychiatrist in the mental hospitals in Glasgow in the 1950s. It was a violent, frightening world in which the doctors tried to manage and control schizophrenics as best they could. Lang had noticed that the psychiatrists hardly ever spoke to the schizophrenics. So as an experiment, he took 12 women and spent months talking to them about themselves and their lives. The results were dramatic. After just a few months, all 12 were well enough to leave the hospital. Within a year, Lang discovered that all of them had returned to the hospital. His attempt at a cure had failed completely. After uh, this um, uh, experiment, these uh, women left hospital and after another uh, year they were all back again. Uh, no one knew why they'd come in in the first place and no one knew why they had to come back again. So that shifted my focus of attention and interest and research uh, interest out into the actual uh, circumstances where uh, this uh, thing called uh, madness is incubated. Lang began to investigate the families of the schizophrenics. His research led him into a hidden, closed world where he studied how the members of the families behaved towards each other in private. And he became convinced that the roots of this madness lay concealed in this unexamined world. The doctors and nurses who used chemicals and ECT to try and return the patients to their families were making a terrible mistake. They were sending them back to the private horror that had first created the madness. If this were true, then the doctors, although they believed that they were doing their public duty and what was best for the patient, were in reality violent agents of oppression. I think it's very important that a doctor remember his duty to give the patient what is best for them in their long-term interest, which isn't always what the patient asks for. If you want to go home to your relatives, the relatives have got to be reasonably sure that you will fit in reasonably well in their home so that they can go on living a normal life. In the early 60s, Lang set up a psychiatric practice in Harley Street in London. He offered radical new treatments for schizophrenia and quickly became a media celebrity. But his research into the causes of schizophrenia had convinced him that a much wider range of human problems were caused by the pressure cooker of family life. Lang decided to investigate how power and control were exercised within the world of normal families. And to do this, he would use the techniques of game theory. Lang had learned about game theory when he visited the Mental Research Institute in Palo Alto in California. A group of research scientists there were trying to use game theory as a way of analysing human interaction. And Lang saw in this the perfect tool to dissect what went on between the members of families in Britain. Lang used game theory in his analysis of families. He was concerned with games, not in the sense of fun, but games in the sense of people playing by rules, some of which were explicit and some of which they were unaware of and which, in a sense, were secret. He thought he'd uncovered a fresh way of looking at human relations, those secret games that people had. This was a way in which it could be subject to some sort of scientific investigation, it could be quantified, you could give people questionnaires. Oh, it was very much the application of game theory. That's exactly what it was. Lang took 20 couples in Britain, and using a complex series of questionnaires, he analysed how each of them saw the other moment by moment in their daily life, continually asking them what they secretly thought the other really intended. Following game theory, he then coded the responses and had them analysed by computer. Out of that, Lang produced matrices which showed how, just as in the Cold War, couples used their everyday actions as strategies to control and manipulate each other. His conclusions were stark, that what were normally seen as acts of kindness and love 
were in reality weapons used selfishly to exert power and control. Lang really did feel that the family was an arena for strategizing. Love was a way in which one person tried to dominate another person. I love you, but I'm making a condition for that love which is impossible for you to fulfill. And so there's nothing you can do to earn my love, even though I'm telling you, you have to earn my love. From this research, Lang argued that the modern family, far from being a caring, nurturing institution, was in reality a dark arena where people played continuous, selfish games with each other. Out of this struggle came stability in society, but a bleak and limited existence for all the individuals involved. The so-called normal farmers that I stood in the course of this work, it was like walking into uh, carbon monoxide uh, gas chambers. Uh, people induced their children to adjust to life by poisoning themselves uh, to a level of subsistence existence that they called life. Lang was radicalized by his findings. He believed that the struggle for power and control that he had uncovered in the family was inextricably linked with the struggle for power and control in the world. In a violent and corrupt society, the family had become a machine for controlling people. Lang believed that this was an objective reality revealed by his scientific methods, above all by game theory. But these very methods contained within them bleak, paranoid assumptions about what human beings were really like. Assumptions born out of the hostility of the Cold War. And what Lang was actually doing was helping spread these bleak, paranoid ideas into other areas of society, into the very way we thought about ourselves and our relationships to each other. He gave a message of, I have seen things that you can hardly imagine a bleak, cold landscape out there that I'm going to do my best to armor you against. And we will walk into there together and we will protect each other back out there in this cold, bleak landscape. But don't you ever bullshit yourself that it's anything more or better than that, because that's where it is. Lang wrote a series of books with titles like The Politics of Experience that became huge bestsellers and he became one of the leaders of the new counterculture movement. The aim of the movement was to make people realize that none of the state institutions of the post-war world could be trusted. Those that claimed to be motivated by public duty and a desire to help were really part of the system that was trying to control your mind and destroy your freedom. The whole mind is, you know, like a cabbage. They're suppressed. They can't do exactly what they want. They haven't got any freedom. They haven't got any freedom to, to do exactly what they want under the system. One had to be constantly on guard, never trusting anyone, even those who said they loved you. A lot of people are caught in the trap that they feel that they ought to trust or believe the person they love because they love them. But I, I don't see that that follows at all. What Lang and the counterculture movement were doing was tearing down Britain's institutions in the name of freedom. And they were about to find the most unexpected allies. They would be joined by a group of economists from the political right who had exactly the same aim and who would become immensely powerful. This group were all inspired by the ideas of Friedrich Hayek. And most of them had also worked at the Rand Corporation and they brought with them the sophisticated mathematical techniques like game theory. They would use these techniques to prove scientifically that the idea of public duty, which had underpinned British public life for generations, was a sham and a corrupt hypocrisy. Their ideas would begin to demolish the old institutions of the British state. They would also introduce the paranoid assumptions of the Cold War ever further into the heart of British society. In 
the early 70s, the government bureaucracies in Britain began to collapse. Those who ran them blamed a growing economic crisis, but it was clear that something much more fundamental had gone wrong. What were supposed to be institutions to help people had become destructive. Those who ran them seemed to have turned against the very people they were supposed to serve. Financial restrictions. What can you get in for a minute? Well, it's urgent, this. I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to disclose that. We don't deal with that sort of thing. Not available. A group of right-wing economists in America now put forward a theory that they said explained why this was happening. At the heart of their idea was game theory. They said that the fundamental reality of life in society was one of millions of people continually watching and strategizing against each other all seeking only their own advantage. An assumption had become a truth. The self-interested model of human behavior that had been developed in the Cold War to make the mathematical equations work had now been adopted by these economists as a fundamental truth about the reality of all human social interaction. We're always trying to infer the intentions of the other. We're always trying to convey our intentions, either deceptively or truthfully. We're always trying to find ways to make believable promises and sometimes to make believable threats. Threatening the Soviet Union, threatening a misbehaving animal, threatening a child, threatening a neighbor. I think what we're doing is what we call strategizing. What does he think that I think he thinks that I think he's going to do? I, it, it has to come to some kind of equilibrium. What is it that we can both recognize is the obvious thing to do? What this meant, the economists argued, was that the politicians and the bureaucrats' belief that they were working for what they called the public good was a complete fantasy. Because to do that depended on creating shared goals in society based on self-sacrifice and altruism. But in a world that was really driven by millions of suspicious, self-seeking individuals, such concepts could not exist. Out of this came a theory called public choice, and a group of economists who were determined to destroy the politicians' dream that they were working for the public interest. Their leader was called James Buchanan. There's certainly no measurable concept that meaningful uh, that could be called the public interest, uh, because how do you weigh different interests of different groups and what they can get out of it? The public interest, as a politician thinks it, does not mean it exists. It's what he thinks is good for the country. Uh, and and to, to, if he would come out and say that, that's one thing. But behind this hypocrisy of calling something the public interest as if it exists, is, is that's, that's what I was trying to tear down. <laughs> In 1975, Mrs. Thatcher became leader of the Conservative Party, and Buchanan's ideas had a powerful influence on her and the group of radicals gathered around her. A right-wing think tank advising Mrs. Thatcher brought James Buchanan to London for a series of seminars, and he explained starkly why the British state was failing. It was pure game theory. Because there was no agreed version of the public good, the bureaucrats and the politicians schemed and strategized in their own self-interest, building up their power and their own empires. They claimed to be helping others. In fact, it was the very opposite. And the result was economic chaos and a breakdown of society. It was chaos. There is no other word for it. And then public choice theory came along and told us why. It's because the self-interest of the groups that have managed to acquire control of the process is such that they're directing these activities to their own advantage at the expense of the rest of society. When public servants and politicians say they're pursuing the public interest, the words are those of public service, the actions are those of self-interest, maximising personal advantage. Now, this is certainly not true because, contrary to popular belief, both myself and my staff here, we take a very, very great personal interest in individual people. I think you're scared. I think because there won't be so much opposition, you don't know whether you're doing the right thing or not. Please if you don't me want me to answer, I'll go home. It's a lovely evening. I don't need to be here. But if you do want me to answer, I will stay. Please, will you give the... 
As the British economy spiralled out of control, the political and bureaucratic elite who had dominated Britain since the war found themselves under attack from both the right and the left. Where once they had been heroic figures who would create a new world, now they were accused of being agents of control, not freedom. We've been ruled by men who live by illusions. The illusion that you can have freedom by government decree. And these new theories began to spread into the public imagination. The writer, who was part of the group advising Mrs Thatcher, began to write a sitcom that explicitly put forward the theories of public choice. As well as being funny, it was ideological propaganda for a political movement. Humphrey, we have got to slim down the civil service. How many people have we got in this department? Two thousand? Three thousand. About twenty-three thousand, I think, Minister. <laughs> twenty-three thousand? In the Department for Administrative Affairs, twenty-three thousand people just administering other administrators? Mm. We'll have to do a time and motion study, see who we can get rid of. Well, we did one of those last year, Minister. And? It transpired we needed another 500 people. <laughs> the fallacy that public choice economics took on was the fallacy that government is working entirely for the benefit of the citizen. And um, this was reflected by showing that in any... Uh, in, in the programme, in Yes Minister, we showed that almost everything that the government has to decide is a conflict between two lots of private interest, that of the politicians and that of the civil servants, trying to advance their own careers and improve their own lives. And that's why public choice economics, which explains why all this was going on, was at the root of almost every episode of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. At the same time, R.D. Lang was continuing his assault on what he saw as the corrupt elites. He was about to use his growing power to attack one of the most powerful professions in America, the medical and psychiatric establishment. The results would be dramatic, but the outcome would be very different from what Lang intended. His ideas would undermine the all-controlling medical elite. But far from liberating people, what would actually emerge would be a revolutionary new system of order and control, driven by the objective power of numbers. It's a space where you can meet with her, where she's not going to be frightened that you're going to put her away or that you're going to do anything to her. Lang was now a celebrity in America and was one of the leaders of what was called the anti-psychiatry movement. Psychiatry, Lang said, was a fake science, used as a system of political control to shore up a violent, collapsing society. Its categories of madness and sanity had no reality. Madness was simply a convenient label used to lock away those who wanted to break free. Hundreds of young psychiatrists came to Lang's talks, and one of them was inspired and decided to find a way of testing whether what Lang said was true or not. Could psychiatrists in America distinguish between madness and sanity? He was called David Rosenham, and he devised a dramatic experiment. He assembled eight people, including himself, none of whom had ever had any psychiatric problems. Each person was then sent across the country to a specific mental hospital. At an agreed time, they all presented themselves at their hospital and told the psychiatrist on duty they were hearing a voice in their head that said the word thud. That was the only lie they should tell. Otherwise, they were to behave and respond completely normally. And then what happened? They were all diagnosed as insane. And admitted to the hospital. All of them? All of them. And were any of them insane? No. There was nobody who could have judged these people as insane. But I told friends, I told my family, I get out when, it's, when I can get out. That's all. Be there for a couple of days and I, I get out. Nobody knew I'd be there for two months. Once admitted, all eight fake patients acted completely normally yet the hospitals refused to release them and diagnosed seven as suffering from schizophrenia and one from bipolar disorder. 
they were all given powerful psychotropic drugs. They found there was nothing they could do to convince the doctors they were sane, and it quickly became clear that the only way out would be to agree that they were insane, and then pretend to be getting better. The only way out was to point out that they're correct. They had said I was insane, I am insane, but I'm getting better. That was a, a, an affirmation of their view of me. When Rosenhan finally got out and reported the experiment, there was an uproar. He was accused of trickery and deceit. And one major hospital challenged him to send some more fakes to them, guaranteeing that they would spot them this time. Rosenhan agreed. And after a month, the hospital proudly announced that they had discovered 41 fakes. Rosenham then revealed he had sent no one to the hospital. The effect of the Thud experiment was a disaster for American psychiatry. It destroyed the idea that they were a privileged elite with specialist knowledge. But those in charge realised that psychiatry could not just give up. Another way had to be found of understanding and managing people's inner feelings in modern society. And like R.D. Lang, they turned to the objective purity of mathematical analysis. They set out to create a scientific system of diagnosing people's inner mental states in which all human judgment would be removed and replaced instead by a system based on the power of numbers. They gave up on the idea that they could understand the human mind and cure it. Instead, American psychiatry created a new set of measurable categories that were only based on the surface behaviour of human beings. Many were given new names, like attention deficit disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. Psychiatry says we don't know the causes for any of these conditions, and then just said, this is what they look like, this is what Depression looks like. This is what ADHD looks like. This is what PTSD looks like. This is what multiple personality looks like. Whether they exist in any particular way, or they exist in the same way, or if they are the same kinds of things, didn't matter. This is just what they look like. What mattered was that these disorders could be observed and thus recorded. The psychiatrists created a system in which the diagnosis could literally be done by computer. The observable characteristics of each of the disorders were listed precisely, and questionnaires were then designed that asked people whether they had those characteristics. The answers were simply yes and no, so they could be asked by lay interviewers, not by psychiatrists. The computer would then decide whether people were normal or abnormal. The lay interviewer asks specific questions and notes them, that person is not making the diagnosis. That data is fed into a computer. The computer program then looks at the pattern and makes the diagnosis. So the diagnosis was made by the computer. There was no clinical judgment required. The psychiatrists then decided to test this system. And at the end of the 1970s, they sent interviewers out across America with the questionnaires. Hundreds of thousands of people selected at random were interviewed. Up to this point, psychiatrists had only dealt with individuals who felt they needed help. This was the first time that anyone had gone out and asked ordinary people how they thought and felt. And the results, when processed by the computers, were astonishing. More than 50% of Americans suffered from some type of mental disorder. These studies revealed very high rates of mental disorder. There are very, very high rates of disorders out there. Half the population has a mental disorder at some point. 17% of the population has a depressive episode at some point. Figures like that. These rates astonish people. They're, they're, they're enormous rates. And the general conclusion was there is a hidden epidemic. More surveys were done. And yet again, the computers returned the same disturbing data. The surveys showed that underneath the surface of normal life, Millions of people, who never before would have been thought of as mentally ill, were secretly living with high levels of mental anxiety. The psychiatrists began screening programs across the country. And for many people, the checklists were a liberation. Their private suffering 
was finally being recognized. I actually heard on the radio they were having a national anxiety screening day. They asked me a bunch of questions, and if you had these symptoms, which it was like 50 symptoms, and I had probably 49 of them, they said, well, what your experience is common. And actually, when I showed up to these meetings, I seen firemen there and construction workers. It was relieving to see that, you know, I wasn't, you know, making this stuff up. These new categories of disorders spread quickly in society, and terms like borderline personality disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder took hold of the public imagination. But as this happened, it had unforeseen consequences. Millions of people began to use the checklists to monitor and diagnose themselves. They used them to identify what was aberrant or abnormal in their behavior and feelings. But by definition, this also set up a powerful model for them of what were the normal behavior and feelings to which they should aspire. And psychiatrists began to find more and more people coming to them demanding to be made normal. It was just a matter of asking people a couple of questions, checking the, the uh, boxes in the diagnostic formula and say, there you are, you have this disease, or I have this disorder, I better go to my doctor and tell him what I need. And it was an amazing experience uh, and a great change. Most people do not previously at any rate, want to see themselves as in some way psychiatrically injured. But now they tell me that they have an ideal in their mind about what the normal person is. I don't fit that model. I want you to um, polish me down so that I fit. This new system of psychological disorders had been created by an attack on the arrogance and power of the psychiatric elite in the name of freedom. But what was beginning to emerge from this was a new form of control. The disorders and checklists were becoming a powerful and objective guide to what were the correct and appropriate feelings in an age of individualism and emotion. But this was a very different system of order. No longer were people told how to behave by an elite. Instead, they now use the checklist to monitor their feelings and police their own behavior. They were reassured that these new categories were scientific and could be checked by the power of numbers. For they are the party of yesterday and tomorrow is ours. In 1979, Mrs Thatcher had come to power in Britain. What she promised to create was a society based on the dream of individual freedom. People would be liberated from the arrogant elites and state bureaucrats of the past. But Mrs Thatcher knew she would have to find a new way of managing and controlling these free individuals in a complex society in order to avoid chaos. And to do this, just like the psychiatrist in America, she would turn to systems based on the objective power of numbers. But underlying the new mathematical models would yet again be the dark and suspicious vision of human beings that the Cold War strategists had assumed. This vision would now penetrate to the very heart of the British state. Begun in the early 80s by selling off many of the state-owned industries. But it soon became clear that in the modern world there were large areas of the state which would have to remain under government control. Yet Mrs Thatcher was determined to free them too from the old forms of management. To do this she would bring in a system no longer run by ideas of public duty. Instead public servants would be encouraged by incentives to follow their self-interest. It was all in keeping with the ideas of the inventor of public choice, James Buchanan. He believed that it was those politicians and bureaucrats who preached the idea of public duty that were the most dangerous, whom he called the zealots. They had to be got rid of. We're safer if we have politicians who are a bit uh, self-interested and greedy and, uh, than, than if we have these zealots. 
the greatest danger, of course, is the zealot who thinks uh, that he knows best or she knows best for uh, uh, the rest of us, as opposed to being uh, for sale, so to speak. So in that sense, you can then use incentives, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Can you just explain Exactly, that? exactly. The zealot is not nearly as, uh, as readily influenced by monetary incentives or incentives of office or rents as the, as the non-zealot. So you don't want too many zealots in there. If our success depends on the goodness of the politicians and bureaucrats, then we're in real trouble. It was a dark and pessimistic vision of human motivation, but it was about to become the basis for a new system of managing the British state. The proposals represent the most far-reaching reform of the National Health Service in its 40-year history. They offer new opportunities and pose new challenges for everyone concerned with the running of the service. In 1988, Mrs Thatcher announced a complete reform of the way the National Health Service was run. The fundamental aim was to overthrow the power of the medical establishment and replace it with a new efficient system of management. To do this, Mrs Thatcher turned to a man who had been one of the nuclear strategists at the Rand Corporation at the height of the Cold War. He was called Alan Enthoven. Back in the 50s, Enthoven's job had been to think the unthinkable, to plan how to fight and win a nuclear war. To do this, he had designed a mathematical system which would use nuclear weapons as rational incentives to manipulate the other side. Enthoven had designed charts that showed how many megatons of bombs to drop on which cities and how many people it would be necessary to kill to prove to the Russians that it was in their self-interest to come to the bargaining table. Out of this, Enthoven had developed a technique he called systems analysis. It was a technique of management that he believed could be applied to any type of human organisation. Its aim was to get rid of all the emotional and subjective values that confused and corrupted the system and replace them by rational, objective methods, mathematically defined targets and incentives. Enthoven had first tried to apply this system back in the 1960s when he was still in the military. The Secretary of Defence, Robert McNamara, asked him to help transform the way the Pentagon was run. Enthoven began by getting rid of the idea that patriotism should be the guiding force in America's defence and replacing it with a rational system based on numbers. The approach we brought to the Pentagon was one based on rational behaviour. Previously that had been at that high level it was kind of a political thing and we were trying to make it more an analytical thing. In defence most people thought it ought to be done on the basis of patriotism. There was quite a bit of that emotion, feeling, are you patriotic and so forth. <laughs> but I was there with my slide rule, you know, my geeky sort of MIT style. Airborne! All the way, sir! Sit down, please. What did the military think of it all? Well, I think that... Um, they hated it. They hated it, yeah. What replaced patriotism and notions of public duty were mathematically measurable outcomes. But McNamara's experiment had ended in disaster when he had tried to run the Vietnam War in a rational, mathematical way, through performance targets and incentives. The most infamous example had been the body count. It had been designed as a rational measure of whether America was winning the war. But in fact, troops simply made it up, or even shot civilians, to fulfill their performance targets. And in 1967, McNamara had resigned. But Enthoven was undaunted, and next he applied his systems to design a rational way of managing health care. He began this in America, but in 1986 Mrs Thatcher had asked him to come and do the same for the NHS in Britain. Just as he had challenged the power of the generals in the Pentagon, now he would do the same for the doctors in Britain. I think in both cases, with the military and the Defense Department and with the doctors both here and in Britain, 
that you have the power of organized elites, of authority and hierarchy. And the system needed to be reconfigured in such a way as to give incentives to do a better job. And it was a matter of how would you rewire the incentives to motivate the self-interest, to create proper incentives to reward efficiency, and can we measure it? So that was a challenge to the power of organized medicine. What Antoven proposed for the NHS, he called the internal market. In fact, what it was, was a mathematical simulation of the free market. Numbers were used to create measurable outputs and performance targets at all levels, while competition was created, driven by a system of incentives. All of this mimicked the pressures of the free market on public servants. To those who set out to create it, it was the engineering of a new freedom. They were liberating millions of public employees from the arrogant control of the old elites. Instead, a new and objective method, based on numbers, set the targets which individuals were then free to achieve any way they wanted. It basically set free their talents. Before, they had simply been instruments doing what they were told. Now, suddenly, they were creative minds allowed to examine and say, why don't we do this? And, and that sense of freedom that comes in thinking, these were their targets, not something that had been wished on them from on high. And that was a very important part of motivation, for they felt they owned their targets. But it was a very narrow and specific type of freedom. It meant shedding all ideas of working for the collective or public good, and becoming instead an individual constantly calculating what would be to one's advantage in a system driven and defined by numbers. At the root of this were the simplified, self-interested creatures that John Nash had created back in the 1950s to make his game theory equations work. But now, the aim of the system of targets and incentives was to transform public servants into just these simplified beings. Individuals who calculated only what was best for them and did not think any longer in wider political terms. There is this vision of these individual isolated humans, that they are only information processors, there's no emotion involved, that people don't get their, uh, some of, of their motives for uh, participating in politics from you know, emotional feelings of being part of something larger than themselves. None of that is allowed in this particular theorem. And so what we have is we have this image of these little information processors who might possibly care about their family or whatever. But I mean, you know, the idea that they have the interests and the welfare of the whole at heart is, is thought to be naive. This is the middle of the checkpoint. The gates have been opened. The police are making no attempt to stop people as they go through and come back. I have never seen such elation. I watched the scenes on television last night and again this morning. You see the joy on people's faces and you see what freedom means to them. It makes you realize that you can't stifle or suppress people's desire for liberty. What do you think of tonight? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. In November 1989, the Berlin Wall collapsed and the Cold War was finally over. A new era of freedom had begun. But the shape that freedom was going to take would be defined by the victors, the West. And as this program has shown, the idea of freedom that had now become dominant in the West was deeply rooted in the suspicion and paranoia of the Cold War. Next week's film will show how this idea spreads to take over politics itself, because it seemed to offer a new and better alternative to democracy. What it actually leads to is corruption, growing rigidity, and the dramatic rise of inequality. And we will come to believe that we really are the strange, isolated beings that the Cold War scientists had invented to make their models work. This bleak vision, far from liberating us, will become our cage.